What's up guys, this is Sherry Talk and welcome back to my channel. On today's video, I'll be making a full review for the Romancing Festival Labelle banner that brings six different units. This is a hybrid banner that they mix it two different banners into one. So we have 1% chance for each of the styles for a total of 10% drop rates. It's much better this way instead of double banners. If you are using free gens, you are going to get 1% chance for each one of the styles and then 4% total for off banners. If you are using pay gens, you only have chances of featured styles, so you can actually get more by your buck. Now, we have La Belle, that is a support unit that can charge overdrive gauge to the party. We have Misty, that is a damage dealer uh, with good sustain for very long fights. Johan, it's a damage dealer with access to damage block that has chase mechanics if he does not take damage. Fuyo is a damage dealer, also the buffer for SDR dexterity that can allow the party to debuff those status as well. Elizabeth is a hybrid of damage and support that buffs STR and will for remembrance. And Sumir is a defensive version of the character that has very high damage potential but relies on inheritance. Let's start talking about Labelle because she gives a name to the banner. She is a hybrid unit with both dexterity and intelligence. She can inherit spells but she herself in this style don't need to use anything related to intelligence. Not even a wind bow. Her endurance and will are on 88% those are good values but not really high and her agility is 94% dexterity on 115% is just okay she's not made for damage anyway moving for passive the first one when she attacks she will recover all surviving ally HP by very small effect that should be around 250 and after she uses her skill number three she will also just restart on usage of her skill number two we'll talk more about that in a few by the end of turn she recovers herself by around 250 and also two points of bp so she is a five bp per turn character and after every five turns counting from the start of battle she also regains a usage of her skill number two and also recovers three bp for free she also has intrinsic bow four when attacking with bows she increases damage by 20 percent and will reduce damage taken when resisted by 40% and still has a 37% chance to evade resist attacks. Skill number one is Splash Shot Plus. That's a 2pp skill with seed power that deals both pierce and cold damage and has critical versus human and fish. You could say that this is a good skill, but not only about she does not want to spend BP unless you have lots of BP batteries. You will use this instead of normal attacks. Skill number two is her selling point, Breezy Foot Bath. It's a support fast skill that will work for all allies, it will remove all debuffs applied, and then she will also grant everyone an attack boost that increases damage potential by 25% on rank 1 or 30% on rank 2. You could theoretically stack this, it's hard to, but yeah, it does work. Then she will fill all other surviving allies OD gorgeous. That's actually good that she's not included because well, I'll explain later. This skill uses 3 BP. Since she gets 5 BP per turn, that's actually pretty nice, since she will always have some surplus of BP. I still need to talk about skill number 3, that's Multi Shot Tidal Water. It's a single target attack with piercing cool damage that costs 9 BP and has triple S power. And then it will cure all surviving allies from ailments and will also boost ailment resistance by very large effect. That's actually the highest value we have to increase right now. And it's like buffing wheel, but it's not removable. Bosses will never be able to remove this. Much like Maria, she can also buff ailment resistance, but curse is not that great. But because of the BP cost, you cannot use it every turn. It's just an extra layer of sustain that can help here and there, but it's not something that you can rely on. Now, this is skill number two, Breezy Foot Bath. This is useful to give OD Gorge to everyone in the party. Why would you want this? First, let's understand what it's an overdrive in this game. When you reach overdrive, if you are using one character, that will already increase the damage of that character. But some characters have special mechanics related to overdrive. If you are using two characters on overdrive, you get that overdrive bonus and you also get a combo bonus. That was always used to increase the damage potential on specific turns to try to finish a boss before it becomes a problem. But now, in this game, we are getting lots of different effects when you are attacking on overdrive. I do believe that the first character that we check that has a very good skill on overdrive is Mask. He was a very good healer for JP. Here on Global, we did have Rag Robin that kind of competed with Mask directly and was superior most of the time. Mask 
When attacking on overdrive, he recovers all surviving allies' HP by around 1.4k in current game. So he could draw more enemy attacks toward himself, and when you get hit, you also build overdrive. Usually on two or three turns, he was capable of healing. This type of mechanic right now, it's not so important, but that's because we got characters that can heal every two turns without having to rely on OD. But we got a recent character that's very nice, and he is also uh, much stronger when attacking on overdrive. Why? When he's on overdrive, Gorge is full. He will grant himself a morale up very large that will increase his damage. He also gets a free attack on overdrive. That's called it Purge. Purge is an attack that hits between 3 to 4 times with C power. That's easily 4S power, and he gets stronger when he's attacking. He has something similar to Action Switch. So I would talk about Creator because he's the easiest one to explain since his free attack is nice and boosts his potential as well. But we could also discuss someone like, for example, Rock Bouquet, newest style. She has a skill that she uses that grants her a uh, passive, call it Recharge. And when she's on Overdrive, she gets a free skill called Darkness Bolt. Darkness Bolt itself is just B-Power that buffs Intelligence and debuffs Enemy's Will. See, that's not that powerful. Okay, but we do have other cards that can uh, do much more on Overdrive, like the latest version of Fagnus. He allows everyone to heal very small effect for the whole party when they are on overdrive. He also has a mechanic where he just uh, fills a random surviving ally OD Gorge that kind of clashes a little with Labelle because she will fill everyone besides her. Uh, but then when you are on overdrive, you're gonna heal. And you have people like Leon that has multi hit attacks based on Chase, those who heal for each attack and you can just make your damage dealer a healer, right? But they need to reach Overdrive. So you can bring both Fagnas and Labelle and allow your characters to heal. Sometimes you may prefer to just bring a dedicated healer that has something else, for example, Muse uh, or Mirza. Well, it will depend, but it's just explaining how you can take full advantage of the Overdrive mechanic. Oh, this is Shadow from the Future, and I forgot to mention Liz, another very good character to get the OD Gorge, because when she attacks on Overdrive, she grants herself this Water Wall counter, and when she gets attacked, she counters with Karatsu Water Wall, that decreases damage taken by 50%, and every time she uses it again, reduces damage taken even further. So, what you can do with Liz is, in turns, where you have Overdrive, you can just use this attack Guarding Bow, for example, that's free. And she will still get the Karatsu counter. And in turns where you don't have the overdrive, you use Karatsu Water Wall. So you try to have defense boosts all the time. It will work better if the enemy uses direct attack, for example. Now, right now in the game, we don't have that many characters that are just as good when they reach overdrive. But we'll get more people in the future, for example, like or Orlete, that will have a strong attack that they will get for free on overdrive. Carve Day, that's double S power and applies defense down. And she can use this as well manually, so you will apply defense down to time. In the future, we will get many characters that have free attacks on overdrive. And I'm not talking about just B power or even double S power, I'm talking about 4S power attacks for free when you reach overdrive. So, what is La Belle gonna do? When you are fighting versus a boss that needs to be cleared as fast as possible, you will grant overdrive many turns in order to do your extra damage via this type of characters. But right now you cannot see, because they are not here. Hence why summoning for La Belle right now may not seem like the best idea. Don't know what you're gonna do with the character. And she seems more skippable, because you don't know how she's gonna work. But I can guarantee you that, in a way, some of those damage dealers will get much stronger by the use of La Belle. She does have something else besides the overdrive mechanic, but it's not that important. It's just that ailment resistance, she can also remove um, debuffs applied, but it's not every turn. Depending on the fight, and if you are doing a challenge, and you are all locked on Series 2, for example, she will work. But now, um, let's talk about something here. First, um, how do you actually use her? Let's use Creator, for example. He starts charging. so. He's on overdrive. We're gonna use him on turn one. He's gonna use that purge attack, and that is a four hit or three hit damage. That, like I said, it's much stronger than a four S power attack that some characters have. 
Now, in turn one, you can already use Breezy Foot Bath. That will charge the Overdrive Gorge of Creator again. So on the next turn, he will do another attack and he will get another attack for free. Then, on turn two, your Labelle has to use Multi Shot Data Water because this will recharge the usage of Breezy Foot Bath. Then she still has enough BP to on turn three use another Breezy Foot Bath. Then Creator will then attack again on turn four on Overdrive and get that extra attack. Now, on turn five, you will recharge for free here and you even get that extra 3 BP. So, uh, it's only by the end of turn. In turn six, you use your Breezy Foot Bath again and you have enough BP to keep using Multi Shot Out of Water every two turns. So, on general, you have Breezy Foot Bath every two turns and your Overdrive attacks will happen in this cycle. But if you are just boosting the damage of Creator, it may not seem like such a big jump. But in the future, if you have three characters with extra effects on Overdrive, that's gonna matter. And if you have, for example, uh, characters that already give you defense boosts, some buffs, additional effects, and they still have an extra attack on Overdrive, Okay, you can use Labelle to try to speed up the damage and kill some challenges that were supposed to be finished in, for example, 10 turns. Labelle can allow for some 6 turns clear. People will use this to clear some challenges where enemies start getting super crazy after a number of turns. That's how she's gonna work. Now talking about inheritances for Labelle, she doesn't really need. You could just go here and say that, well, it's okay to have Tender Song as inheritance because it does clean ailments, but... She already has a AoE ailment cleanse. She has from her platinum style both confusion for Wuhan and unconsciousness for Siegfried, if you want to use her there. And I have to say that right now she does not affect much the game because she relies on future characters. You could theoretically skip her if you want, and even when she returns, she can be interesting, or they may even power creep the character in the future. I don't know. But all I can say is that right now in the game, I'll give her a triple S grade, but she eventually can be perceived as an OP grade character because she makes a lot of different people better. It's just a different type of mechanic that people are not used to that will be much better in the future. Labelle has a different style on JP that got released way later that is much of our utility character that keeps buffing people and she also gives OG points instead of full overdrive gauge, but you can give lots of points and uh, have a similar setup. You can inherit that skill as well so that you have a turn where you guarantee an OD dodge and the other turns you'll be giving uh, just points. It just works, but it's not exactly dependent on having the current label. It just makes it better. The next character is Misty and she is very strange. We have only 67% endurance and 125% intelligence. And that's a very good volley, alongside very good agility too. Will is at least high on 105%. Uh, the first passive is called Dire Will, and she will apply a passive to the whole party. And this one here is very crazy. He will buff four different status by 15%. Those are Agility, Intelligence, Love and Charisma. Agility and Intelligence are good status for mages, so that they are faster, have better currency and do more damage. Love and Charisma will just allow you to heal better. Agility could also increase the damage of martial arts, but you are lacking STR, it's not a full potential. Now, uh, the character is based on increasing damage via the passage of turns. We have one hit up that increases damage potential by 10% all the time, and you can trigger this 5 times for 50% on turn 5. You have another hit up that triggers on odd turns, so... It will only end by turn 9, but Summit, you have 100% increase in damage via heat ups, then you have a 30% at all times, and then a 15% at all times. So, eventually, you can reach the max potential of 145% increase in damage, but only by turn 9. She also has defense ups that increases her defenses by 10%. For a total of 40% damage reduction by turn 5, but she also has this defense down <laughs> that decreases her defense and it's a small effect for two turns, but it stacks and it will trigger five times per battle. So the first five turns, even if she's getting defense up, she is also self-harming herself, decreasing her defense. So the defense down is 10% reduction. That means that the first two turns you are just negating your defense up. 
She needs to find a different way to increase her defenses and I'll explain in a few. At least she has 4 VP per turn and she gets another 1 when landing a weak attack. She needs to be used versus enemies that are weak. That complicates her situation even further. Now, skill number 1 is called Dark Drop. It's a single target attack with blunt and slash damage that will have B power. Pretty nice for just 1 BP cost, but it hurts everyone else in the party by 5% of their max HP. But it does have an explanation why this is like this. Because Dire Will, the passive that she gives to the party, will only trigger if your character is not on full HP. So, she has a way to self-harm the party, but not herself. If she is on full HP, she will not buff herself. But, in boss fights, most of the time, you are not on full HP. But then, why? Just 4 status and you need to have... Uh, lower HP. Why we have people like the latest Nawa's daughter that has um, okay, it's every two turns, but she buffs all status from all surviving allies by 15%. See that it's much easier. She also gives VP. It's strange, of course. Nawa's daughter is just full support, barely does damage. While Misty could theoretically do damage, but she does not do enough, in my opinion. So, a way to go usually before your other cards because of agility to hurt them a little so that they can self buff but in the end sometimes guys just that five percent hp you lost may be your doom skill number two is nocturne that is something that she stole from shira it's a single target attack with blunt and shadow that debuffs str and agility by 15 percent with a chance it's not a guarantee but it's two status and well, if the enemy has martial arts skills, you're gonna decrease the accuracy and the damage by very good values. The skill itself costs 6, so you need to land weak attacks to recover 5 in order to keep using this most turns. Since the debuff meta is back, that can kinda work, but you see that she doesn't have a focus, she's using lots of different elements. In the third one, she changes again. It's a single target attack with double S power and 9 BB cost that has slash and pierce damage and she applies defense boost of a large effect that decreases damage taken by 35. That's how she survives. You can use this on turn 1 so that you have something to reduce damage taken and then eventually she will not keep casting the defense down. You can even just stop using skill number 3 if you want because she will not take as much damage. She still gets hurt via physical attacks though. Only 67% endurance is very bad for a current game and she will just die especially before uh, her defense ups stack it. Now, uh, you could just inherit something from her first style, that's Falling Star. This skill here is one or two hits with a power. So if you hit two times, it's like triple S power for just 6 BP, but it, it's related to RNG. Uh, Big Bang Star is a <laughs> single target attack that hurts 20% of the max HP of everyone else. It's totally bad. Because right now in the game, we have already 10 BP skills that do forest power. Just like Matriarch and Shroud, they have an option like this. But it's just Pierce. But okay, we don't need to use this type of skills anymore. She does have this Stone Curse that can apply Petrification. She is the best Petrificator in the game because she has a medium chance and a 6 BP cost. She can apply Paralysis easily as well. She can help you with Real Queen, for example. And in her latest style, she has some skills that can be used for farming, but that style is already good enough to do that. So there's no really good inheritance, to be honest, with Misty. She is a character that theoretically works, but in real case scenarios, it's hard to keep her alive. And the uh, risk is too high for a very low payoff. Misty is not that great. I would not recommend pulling for her. I will give her a plain SS grade for being such a hard character to use. The next character is Johan, and he has 120% STR and 105% Agility. Those are actually good combinations for a sword user, he's fast and he can do some damage. His endurance and you are on the 78 and 77, those are not good values, he would take lots of damage and I will explain later. He does have some intelligence because he can inherit some debuffs. Moving on, the first passive gives him a stealth stance with medium effect that lasts for 4 turns and stacks. So. The more turns passes, the less likely he will be targeted. But he does buff his STR and agility by 20% on the start of a turn even before he attacks. That's nice because it will increase his damage for sword skills, but also for martial arts attacks if he inherits those. And high agility can lead to evasion and 
attack before bosses. And by the end of a turn, if he did not take any damage, he would then enter an energy charge stance that will have only one count. That means that by the end of that same turn, it will be charged. So on turn two, Johan can already attack with double blood rage. Double blood rage is just two times blood rage plus. That is an attack with triple S power slash and shadow that can debuff the endurance of an enemy. That is a strong attack. Yes, it is. But you are attaching into not taking damage. We need to discuss this. But two triple S power attacks, it's actually pretty strong. Then passive two, when he's on full HP, he increases damage potential by 30%. Then he has under 30% all the time. And when he is attacked, he has a 50% chance to evade. And then if he didn't evade that, he will have a 25% chance to try again. So see that he does have good chances to evade. He wants to uh, not take damage in order to charge. But how he does that? He does that by use of his skill number two, Saga Train Journey. He only uses two times per battle. That's the problem. He does not recharge this. He needed to recharge. And he will get that four damage blocks with no turn limit and recover his HP by probably around 1.8 thousand. But it does cost 8 PP, guys. 8 PP. You start the fight with just 10 and then you use this. That means that on turn 3 you can use again. And that's exactly how it's gonna work. You use it and you really need to negate damage in turn 1. But that will likely happen because four blocks. Okay. And then you still have the evasion chance that will try to trigger first. Then you enter the energy charge stance and then on turn 2 you're going to attack two times with triple S power. Then on turn 3 you want to use Saga Train Journey again to get 4 damage blocks. So with that extra 4 damage blocks you have a total of 8. If he's not evading you are wasting your damage blocks, right? You could theoretically say that with good RNG, depending on number of attacks from a boss, you could make your Johan survive for 8 turns. In those 8 turns, he will uh, attack with his uh, double triple S attack, double blood rage. And then if in that specific turn that he already used a double blood rage, does not get hit, he will charge it again. That's right, in the same turn he can charge it. So, um, Q will use double blood rage in turn 3 if you did not get hit and that will stop you from using Saga Train Journey. Why? Because you lose control over your skills when you are on an energy charge. But, okay, let's say that he took damage. In that moment that he took damage, he will self recover and then be able to use Saga Train Journey. But by the point where he lost all of his damage blocks, what happens? He will have to rely on evasion. And if he gets hit, what will happen? He does not have any damage reduction. So for fights that can last for maybe 8 turns, with good RNG, Johan will survive, he will do damage, but we have to talk about full potential of the character. He has 30% locked into full HP, and just another 30% that is active all times. But he does self buff as the and agility by 20%. Is that reason enough to keep him on very good damage potential? No, it's not. Someone like Leon will do more damage easily without having to carry about too many different gimmicks. But Leon uses LP. Silver uses LP. So Johan works if you get lots of change uh, energy charges with double blood rage. But there is still the problem where if he loses all of his damage blocks, he will become extremely fragile. So use Johan when the enemy does not attack too much. Johan will survive, he will do good damage, but he's not a generalist, he's much more of a specialist. But now, after he is not capable of using either Saga Train Journey or his chase attacks, you have to rely on skill number one, that's a free attack with low damage, but increases his action order. I don't know why, because it will only work for the next turn. And he has that in. That's a triple S attack, which is a slash damage that can apply instant Q to targets. Okay, attack, nothing special. And that's what he's gonna use. Uh, if you have inheritances, I could tell you that from his platinum style, Shadowless Strike can apply poison for Carmine. 
and there is also Rising Sun from his older premium style. That is a 4S attack that uses Blunt instead of Slash, but it also hurts 1 LP. So, you will also only be able to use this if he is not on the energy charge stance. Hence why Johan is just so hard to use. He could theoretically do good damage, but because he's not a generalist, he only works for specific fights where you can take control of the number of hits, I think he only deserves an SS plus grade. There's no future version of Johan, so he is now on a dead end for now. The next character is Fuyo, and she is a ninja from Romancing Saga 2, that means that she inherits stuff from Azami. We have 116% SDR, that's just okay, but Ajirid is 130, that's the highest one in the game right now. And her endurance is bad, just 65%, with Will being just okay with 86%. She does have intelligence because she can inherit debuffs, and she can debuff in a different way, that we will explain later. First passive, when attacked, damage will reduce it by 25%, and she has uh, extra 2 BP, that means 5 BP per turn. Start of a turn, she grants herself one evasion for one time, only one turn, if it triggers in that turn, it's over, if it doesn't, it's over the same way. And she buffs her STR and agility by 15%. That's actually pretty nice, it will scale her damage. And then she has maximum voltage. On the start of a turn, she grants herself a heat up, that increases damage potential by 30%. And that's for the whole fight, you can reach as much as 150% damage increase in just 5 turns. That's, you know, pretty similar to what you get with Misty without having to care about too much stuff. And that evasion is actually pretty welcome, and at least she does have the damage reduction, although physical damage will still hurt her a little. For skills, the first one is Assault Sobat. It's a single target attack with just blunt damage and just 1 BP cost with C power that applies morale down to the enemy, decreasing damage taken by 15%. This lasts for 2 turns, so you have to cycle every 2 turns. Her agility is pretty fast, she's probably gonna attack the enemy before the enemy attacks you. The second one, Ninja Lesson. It's a support skill that will grant all surviving alliance two different passives, Enervate 3 STR and Enervate 3 Dexterity. Those will be permanent in battle. If you use this, it will be attached to all characters. But what is this? Well, this is both interesting and strange. Enervate has a chance to debuff. First, you have two different RNGs. The first one is, it will check your intelligence and the enemy will. And then, if your intelligence is high enough, you have 25% chance to buff a status from that enemy. The debuff value will be 15% when both RNG works. Now, Puyo herself has only 92% intelligence. Is this enough to debuff some hard challenges? It's not, and I have to say that. You need to bring an intelligence buffer at least one It's very good right now, and that one is use you can still also use someone like Nal's daughter you can also use Melissa if you want or Maria but depending on the circumstances uh, you may not have enough intelligence to land the buffs and she applied this to the whole party let's say you are bringing Leon Leon does have some good intelligence because Leon is a debuffer himself in any of his styles he will have something that may not be that high, right? But he does have something. You can see even his first style already had something. But then, the really good characters to, to use with this setup are staff users or intelligence-based characters like, for example, Bertrand. Bertrand, in his school style, he has 122% intelligence. And you can also run Creator. Creator is the best one to use here because Creator will attack multiple times. He gets chains and the chains attacks can trigger those passives as well see 122 percent intelligence is more than enough so you need to think well about the cards that you are bringing in order to take full advantage of fuyo because anyway you may just have a passive that doesn't work it's interesting to have both str and dax or debuffs because those will work for physical attacks i prefer to have intelligence based debuffs those that come from Medea, because uh, intelligence also governs debuff chances, also governs ailment infliction chances, and Medea will debuff STR and intelligence. It's the best setup, and she also applies Morale Down. Well, Fuyo also applies Morale Down, but her version is small, just decreasing by 15%. The case of Medea is 25%, lasts for 3 turns instead of 2, and she also attacks in a colo. But it's an alternative has to rely in even higher RNG than Medea, 
but you could say that it can work. Now, let's move to the skill number 3, Ninjutsu Izuna Drop Rush. This is a single target attack, just blunt damage, triple S power, 9 DP cost. So, her cycle is to use this skill and then Assault Sobot and go back to this skill. At least this one is fast. It's nice because it's a debuff attack that can debuff STR and Dexter both by 20% on max level and then she will also remove the targets buffs that's a buff break but just for str and dexter and this is kind of made for the future some bosses will keep buffing themselves like many of the recent bosses have and it becomes a problem and you sometimes you have to bring a debuffer and a buff breaker in the situations where you only need to care about str and dexter just bring fuyo it's gonna help you and she can be your main debuffer because of this cycle and then on the second turn you use your assault so bot so you are decreasing damage in turns where you are not debuffing it's actually something that works and you will open the fight by use of enervate but sometimes you may not even want to use this and i will explain because if you debuff too much you can trigger the fire weakness and since you just remove the buffs from the enemy the fire weakness will happen more often so the character is not just about Ninja Lesson, even though it looks like the most interesting thing about the character, it's not. And with Ninja Lesson, you can trigger just the STR debuff, sometimes just the Dexter debuff, sometimes both, sometimes none. It's not reliable, while Ninjutsu Izuna Drop Rush is reliable. A very high agility and sadly not the best intelligence. Even when you are trying to use her as a debuffer, she may still need intelligence buffs. Now for inheritance, she can inherit from Azami styles, but there's nothing that really changes how she operates. You could use Little Witches for agility buff to the party on Remembrance only, I guess. And you do have Cascading Counter from the Summer style to allow her to become a counter unit, but she only gets BP by the end of turn. It will not be capable of using this every turn. And from her Mask style, we have Poison to use versus Carmine. Everything else just doesn't make much sense. Go for Broke allows her to be paralyzed, so why? And Ninjutsu Thousand Blades could only be really useful if you want to use it versus Death Master. That's it, the character is interesting, can work, but relies um, squad building for characters that do have higher intelligence in order to work, and even then she may need help to become a full debuffer. I don't think she's as good as Medea, but since she does buff break and debuffs i believe that right now in the game she deserves something between ss plus and triple s i think she will get a triple s grade but if you don't agree please say here on the comment section the dia was upgraded to op grade so having just one different layer makes sense to me the next character is elizabeth and she is a character made for remembrance but she can also work in serious challenges and some people without options can use her own hard content as well not much damage, just 115% STR, we have 80% endurance and 85% will, those are just okay values. 99% agility is pretty good for a buffer, and she does have higher charisma because she can apply charm. Moving for passives, she increases damage potential for all allies by 10%, reduces damage taken for all allies as well by 10%. She starts a turn, she gets 2 BP, that means she's a 5 BP return character, and also triggers a stealth stance that has medium effect, lasts for only that turn. That means that she has less chances to be attacked. That makes sense. Then the second passive, when she attacks, she will recover HP by around 270s. And she will also grant all surviving alliance defense boosts that decrease damage taken by 10%. This lasts for two turns and it will stack with other defense boosts. So when you use uh, a different attack on the second turn, you have at least two defense boosts. But you may have more because when she attacks, she does have a 50% chance to chase with competitive roar. This attack here is actually something that she can also use it as a skill. And it's a single target attack with blunt damage that buffs all surviving alliance STR and will by 15% because it's rank 1. So, okay, because you're getting it from free, kind of reminds me a little of how Razen works. So let's say that you have very good luck. In the first turn, you use it, your attack, even competitive roar, this is... Um, 5 VP attack with 8 power and she has 5 VP all the time and you buff it STR and will by 25. And then you got a chase. That means that in that turn you buff it STR and will by 40% and you trigger 2 defense boosts of 10% damage reduction. If you do it again on the second turn, you will get another 40% buff and you trigger 2 defense boosts. 5 times minus 10% 
damage, it's equal to around minus 40% damage for the whole party. In the best situations. In the uh, worst situations, you only have two defense boosts and one 10% reduction, so that means you have around 27% reduction. So, still okay, not as reliable, not as good as some other characters, for example, Impress now decreases 25% at all times and she has a lot of different utility, Death decreases by 30%, so on, and then you have also Noah's Daughter, characters that will usually be used much more than Elizabeth, but she does have something to offer for Remembrance Battles since she can help offensively and defensively. She still has Intrinsic Club 4 that increases her damage potential by 20%, it's the only way to increase her damage via passive. She has a 40% damage reduction when causing resist and 37% chance to evade resist attacks. You have to check her equipment because you need to have at least 35 points of resistance. Then the first skill we already discussed it, for 5 EP she can use this any turn. Just remember that when she's attacking she's also self-healing. And then the second skill is Coin Body Rise. This is a column attack that has double S power and can inflict charm. This is not made for farming, this was made for a Wuhan fight because the enemies are aligned in a column and you can apply charm in a specific turn and use it again when needed. So she fixes the problem with Wuhan. And we did have other cards that also applied charm or did something similar to help versus Wuhan. I even cleared with just using mask and buffing will to survive the instant kill attacks and paralyzes, but this makes the fight much easier. Then the third attack is a single target blunt attack that has triple S power and 10 BB cost, that deals blunt damage and after that heals her HP by at least 1.5 thousand. So, she will mostly be used for skill 1 and for her defense boosts. Buffing STR and will will increase damage and also resistance to magical attacks, ailments and debuffs. Those are something that you always want. But she does have inheritance as well, like for example, you can grab Frying Pan from her Platinum style, and you'll be able to stun Kazinsi. And you can get from her uh, first premium style, Revetting Revolt. That is a double S power attack with 9 BP cost, she can use it every two turns. That can only be used five times per battle, but it will allow her to enter an evasive stance where she will negate everything in that turn. So, we will use it every two turns, every two turns, zero damage for five turns. Then in her uh, Global Axe style, you can use Multidirectional Strike to paralyze the real queen. And that's it, I don't think anything else really matters for the character. Elizabeth is a nice character to use for those that are starting out and need some defense boots in specific fights while also buffing STR and will. But generally, people will prefer to use someone like Nao's daughter or even the newest Final Impress, but she just does work. In the end, she's not as strong as some of our older options, but they are also placed very high on the cheer list. That means that she does have something to offer like buffing offensively and defensively, and while not better than characters like Final Impress or Nao's daughter, they are on the top, meaning that she can get a triple S grade to stay as a useful character for Remembrance, serious challenges, and for people that skip it, people like Death, Fun and Press, or the like. This is also the last version of Elizabeth so far, but she's a pretty popular character, I do believe she got something in the future. The last character is Sumir, and oh my god, this character is actually pretty good if you have inheritance. Without it, we will have to discuss. 115% STR and agility, but she's just a sword user. 92% endurance, and we are actually pretty good for a nuker and the other status won't matter as much. Moving for passive, she starts the fight with 13 BP, and by the start of a turn, she will always buff her will by 20%, so she will be even easier to use versus enemies that try to apply humans or buffs. Then, when she is directly attacked, she will always, always reduces the damage and counterattack with Brusque Slice. Brusque Slice is now a 1 BP attack with C power that gives down, so she will be more attacked, this is stacks and then cast Squared Up Small. The decreases damage taken by 12%. It's not really a strong attack by any means. Then uh, she still has now a 25% chance to counter again. And she will counter with Hisatsu Sakura Chaos. That is uh, this other attack here that has double S power, slash and pierce this time, and applies defense down medium to the enemy just for one turn. She still has a revive, when she dies, she revives with 50% of her HP. 
then she has 37% chance to evade all enemy attacks alongside 25% damage reduction and when landing a weak attack she recovers 2 BP. Now, just give a look on something. She has zero damage passives. That's right. Nothing increases her damage here. You have different ways to do so, but it's much better to bring people that will buff her STR if possible, alongside some other stuff like, I don't know, maybe attack boosts, morale ups, this will help her in a way. Now, skill 1 we already discussed it, Brusque Slice Plus, it's a single target attack with slash damage that taunts and applies guard up. For just 1 BP, it's actually pretty easy to use. But since it's just slash, that means that you are restricted in order to get those 2 BP. Then the second skill is Vertical Slash, that's a column attack with double S power, then before she attacks she will buff her STR by 25% and then she launches an attack. If you're using her versus enemies that are weak, choose Slash, she will be able to choose this 3 times in a row. But since she's not really made for damage as she is, she may not be capable of soloing, but I do believe that in story it will work. Then we have the third one, that is a single target attack that is also fast with slash damage that will grant the user a defense boost of large effect that decreases damage taken by 35%. Lasts for 3 turns and can even stack if you manage to use it, but 13 BP for triple S, a little too costly, right? But man, this character was designed with inheritance in mind. Without it, it's just way too limited, hence why we need to discuss it right now. It all makes sense when you look into her latest style. This one here, from Christmas, in the same banner as Asos. She has this uh, skill called Ninjutsu, Present Swift Blade. That is a skill that you can only use 3 times per battle, but when you attack, it will grant herself a Ninjutsu Present. That is the same skill again as a chase. So, you use it 3 times, you always have 3 times as a chase this attack. And it's just a slash. But now, how does she actually work? Well, the inheritance of the Junsu presence with Blade, you can use it on turn 1. That will give you one chase. Then on the second turn, you are already attacking, getting the chase, and the enemy is weak to slash, and you are getting extra BP. On turn 3, you can use the Junsu present Blade again. And then you can use it for the third time on turn 4. That will give you the last chase. In turn 5, you already have enough to have built all of your chases and start already using her vertical slash for example. This will buff STR and all of your chases will do more damage. But you can also opt to use Karatsu Lion so that instead of buffing your STR you, you buff your defense via defense boost. To be honest you can actually cycle between those two skills so that she has both damage and defense sustain and it just works. Now, why would you want this Sumir instead of the past one? This is something that people need to discuss. Because the past one has much lower sustain. She was a character that at least had one damage reduction. And then she has four chases because she gets one for free via passive. She can do more damage but would take much more from the enemy. But at least she does have one damage block. It depends on the fight. Some fights uh, where the damage is pretty high, you will prefer to use the newest. If you just want fast damage, you want to use the Christmas one, because this one can even have four chains attacks. And if you want to use this character for farming, you can inherit that other column attack instead of the row attack, and choose when you want to use the character for farming. But you need to have both. But now, what if you don't have the Christmas Sumir in order to inherit present play? You are doomed. This character is really bad without inheritance. When you look on it, zero damage increase. 13 BP in order to use a triple S power attack. That gives defense boost, but whatever. A character that taunts but has a very weak counter. With a 25% chance to do a better one, but really, really weak. I will give it a SS grade if you don't have inheritance and i'll give it an op grade with inheritance because it's just a different type of build of a character that is already described as op so with inheritance is just a more defensive version of the character without inheritance not worked very weak and barely useful just works as an ss grade via damage reduction and the other inheritance if you only have the first sumir 
is really bad. There's nothing here that stands out. So, do you have Christmas Sumir? Okay, you do. You like the character? Okay, to pull. If you don't, don't pull. Ignore the character. There's way too many slash damage dealers in the game. But Sumir is the strongest one in her Christmas style and has better sustain with the newest one. Well, she doesn't have any future style so far on JP, but she stays relevant for the time being. With all that said, going back to the better image, is this banner worth Sumuni for? I have to say that yes and no. Well, yes, because Labelle is a very interesting character that will be better in the future. But by the time that she is really good, we may get someone that will replace her, or we will get close to a rerun of the character. All the other characters may be good here and there, but they are not must-haves. The good point about this banner is that it has 6 different styles, and we have a 10% drop rate on total. If you are using Pay Gens, you have high chances of getting something. And if you are using free gens, you still have those off banner chances that can actually be terrible. But it's that sort of banner where you can just do some pulls and be happy with what you get. If you got Labelle, nice. If you got Fuyo and you can make use of the character, or Elizabeth, or Sumir because you had an inheritance, then pretty nice. But don't go for 45,000 gens for a pity unless you have plenty and you really want to play with OG mechanic. But I would still recommend waiting at least one week to see what's coming up. This banner receives only a silver grade award based on the number of characters in a 10% drop rate. Without it, it would be worse. But that's my opinion. What is yours? Please say here in the comment section. I already pulled it on this banner. I got super lucky. But what do you think about it all? I want to see you on the next video or live stream. Bye.